Happy birthday. It's the 10th year of the celebration of the Wheeler Centre. My name is Carolyn Briggs. I'm the elder of the Ellicott Willem clan of the Bunwurrung. I'm here re representing my elders, both past and present, and to our futures. So in the language afforded to me, it's Womanjika. Come with a purpose to our beautiful home, the lands of the two great bays. We we are here today on the lands of the Ellicott Willem of the country of the of my ancestors and we pay respects not just today but always to all our ancestors and those people who came before us. To all of you here today a truly great day for you to be amidst this turmoil that we have all been living through this year. As a family member of the Yalakut Willem of the Bonwarang clan of Melbourne's first people I am pleased to be able to welcome you here today. We are especially pleased to recognise the commitment you have made here today in paying respects to the spirit of this land and to the First Peoples. Through this, you have shown a willingness to honour sacred ground, or what we call Warongi Bik. Today, we acknowledge the Wheeler Centre on the country of unceded lands. The Bunwarang were custodians of the lands that stretch from the Wilson's Promontory all the way to the mouth of the Werribee River. And both, and also encompassing both our beautiful bays, Nurm, Port Phillip Bay and Marin, Western Port Bay. It is important for all Australians and fellow country and to our guests to understand and appreciate the history, the culture of the First Peoples of Melbourne, who have played a very significant role in the development of Melbourne both here and after the European arrivals. Unfortunately, our First People are not known by many people who live on this land. The struggles to preserve our culture and heritage has also, and also its traditions began with our ancestors in the 1830s. And one of the lessons we should take from that struggle was the way our elders, our leaders of the day forged an alliance that led to many of the achievements that we can sometimes we take for granted today. And our elders still today, 160 years later, in continual discussions with leaders of today to advance the recognition and the reconciliation for the First Peoples. Our people of, on this continent known as Melbourne or this part of the country known as Melbourne, we all have, have descended from different clans, different language groups, and we should all support our elders' right for a voice to government, our rights to for a treaty which in Victoria has started on this pathway, and the truth-telling about the continent's dark history. The word Womanjika translate come with a purpose. It is also a contract between people and the custodians of this land and yourselves to ensure these laws of Bunjil, our creator, adhere to, are adhered to, to a guarantee safe passage for those who ask. And according to our traditions, our lands will always be protected by our creator, Bunjil, who travels as an eagle, and by Wan, who protects our waterways, travels as a crow, Bunjil taught us to always welcome guests, but he required us to ask all guests to make a number of dumbbells or commitments, not to harm our big bigs, our lands, not to harm our warnies, our waterways, and particularly not to harm Bunjil's children, our bubbles. And if you commit those to those commitments of a dumbbell, we'll live in a better world. This commitment is made through an exchange 
of a small bow dipped in the water of the land. So once again, Ormanjika, Marin Big Big, Bunarong, Nirmdurp, Akta Willem. We all, like I said, we have these commitments of the, the law. We also have that law of Jambana. The law speaks of community, the importance of community, the importance of diverse community, but a unified community. And the Kulin Nation understood the power of diversity and what is what within our lands and which increases our capabilities. It was always good to share our stories and different experiences, just like when we go to the Wheeler Centre. The Wheeler Centre is about storytelling. It's about sharing. It's having a platform to be able to create challenges or what we talk about is those risks. But it is about that celebrating the futures and hopes of Urimboy, what we call as Urimboy, or Gilbrook, respect. So these are the laws that connect us. So when we think about why we're, why we're here today, we are transmitting hope and respect to all what the Wheeler Centre has to offer us for the futures. So in that, I can hear to the three Warongi Biks, the laws of the land. I can say in my ancestors' words, Wamanjika Marambik Bik Bunarong, Nandu, Baraktan, Arta Willem. We come with a purpose to our beautiful home, the lands of the two great bays, Nungujin. Thank you, Nawit, Carol and Breeze, for that beautiful welcome to country and birthday message for the Wheeler Centre. My name is Caro Llewellyn and I am the CEO of the Wheeler Centre. Welcome to our final event of the year, Make It New 2021 and Beyond. What a year it's been. We're so excited to have you join us tonight as we hear from some of the country's most talented writers and performers sharing their thoughts and reflections on the year that's been and the future we're stepping boldly into together. Our official bookseller for tonight is Readings, and you can purchase copies of all these wonderful writers' books through the Readings website. First, we'll hear from Trent Dalton. Trent is a Walkley award-winning staff writer for The Weekend Australia magazine and a former assistant editor of The Courier Mail. His best-selling debut novel, Boy Swallows Universe, broke records to become the fastest-selling Australian debut novel ever and has won many Australian literary prizes and is currently being adapted for the stage and the screen. His most recent book is All Our Shimmering Skies, which became an instant bestseller when it was published in September. Hello, everybody. My name's Trent Dalton. Um, it is my great honour and privilege to be here with the Wheeler Centre today. Um, I'm sharing a few thoughts a few stories on 2020 um, and I'd love it if you'd just let me read them. I might just go ahead and dive in. Um, it's a great pleasure to be telling some stories to such lovers of story. I will remember the Monopoly games. I will remember fear. I will remember the homemade sourdough. I will, I will remember the loss. I will remember my daughter nursing the marigolds my wife planted in the garden in lockdown. I'll remember the fire. I'll remember the way my wife said she loved me and how it chilled me to the bone. We were making ham and cheese toasties together for a weekday lunch because we did that when the virus sent us home to an open-ended isolation. And she said something I haven't heard her say in 20 years. I need you, she said. I need you three here. And she meant me and my two girls, 13 and 11. Here on earth, she meant. Not here for any other reason but being alive. Because that's how we bloody talked this year. Matters of life and death over ham and cheese cho toasties with chili jam. Something in her eyes. Love in her heart as deep and real as the dread in her belly. That sure escalated quickly. This all started because I showed her a small burn on my right forearm that I got cooking pancakes for the kids. She wanted me to put some betadine on it and dress it with a big square elastoplast with special antibacterial silver 
I told him my theory, which is baseless and ill-researched, that cuts and abrasions are best left undressed and allowed to heal in the open air. Then she got all cross and said the burn was deeper than I thought and that I might get a staph infection like our friend Glenn and find myself in the emergency department of the Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital. And you are not going to hospital, she said. And I watched this woman, this wife of mine, flip those toasties onto our lunch plates and I knew for certain in this moment that a vile and infectious agent moving among us had made me cherish that woman more than ever before. I'm getting a bit emotional. <laughs> um, I'll remember Cherish by Madonna. I'll remember all the notes dropped in our letterbox. Hello, my name's Ben. With the likelihood of increasing social distancing and quarantining at home, I thought it'd be good to get ahead of it and put myself out there for when people need help. I live at the end of the street and usually work as a musician, but with no gigs for possibly a long time, I have time on my hands. I can serenade you if you want, outside your door if nothing else. I'll remember the girl from JB Hi-Fi. I watched her search high and low to find the last remaining laptop in stock for my mum who needed a computer to work from home. She didn't have a computer. You don't know what this means to me, I said to her. You know what? She nodded like she knew exactly what it meant to me. I'll remember the kids in our local childcare centre doing paintings and making care packs for the elderly, musicians doing pop-up piano concerts in cul-de-sacs, people with spare time on their hands joining working groups led by engineers who were repurposing equipment to make more respirators for the ill, people across Australia sitting in their living room sewing bloody scrub caps and masks for hospital staff and the public, the dance instructor giving lessons to my daughter via Zoom on a laptop on our back deck, just there, just there. The way my daughter managed her feelings on all this uncertainty. If she heard too much car radio talk about the stats, the New York death tolls, the Rome death tolls, the London death tolls, she started playing Cherish by Madonna from her Spotify playlist. And there's something so ridiculous and yet so beautiful about cutting from pandemic death stats to cherish is the word I use to remind me of your love. I'll remember the numbers and I'll remember the words. Numbers are cold. Words are warm. Words are fire. Numbers are ice. Twas ever thus. Mathematics versus English. Head versus heart. Fact and figure versus feeling. Stats versus story. Two zero two zero. Four cold figures forming a number that will be whispered only in the blackest corners of the most cavernous bars of our bright, bright futures. A number to be shuddered at and shivered at, murmured only with the tightest fist grip on a shot glass brim filled with the warmest of whiskies. Warm, warm drink for a cold, cold think. But just a bloody year after all. 2020. Numbers are cold, words are warm. 1.2 million global coronavirus deaths, and hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. 305 million global job losses and the caged bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown but longed for still. 18.6 million hectares of native Australian bushland burned in the black summer bushfires and the woods are lovely, dark and deep but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep. Miles to go before I sleep. 34 lives lost, 5,900 buildings and homes destroyed, almost 3 billion animals killed or displaced, and here is the deepest secret nobody knows. Here is the root of the root and the bud of the bud and the sky of the sky of a tree called life, which grows higher than soul can hope or mind can hide, and this is the wonder that's keeping the stars apart, the stars in our southern skies, all our shimmering skies, all our terrifying horizons. I'll remember, was I sure? The whole horizon was lit up, was I told me in February. He was standing on the rickety wooden deck of his miraculously still standing home in the town of Mogo in the Bigger Valley Shire. Sounded like a freight train, was I said. Whoomp, whoomp, whoomp. This thing didn't stop louder and louder and louder until that train bloody pulled into the station. I'd gone south to see the damage the fires had done. I knocked on Woz's door with a single question. What the hell did you just live through? The apocalypse, Woz said. A father or two, mullet haircut, 
heart, the colour and size of Uluru. Wazza got his family to safety, then returned to Mo- his Mogo Street where he fought a raging kilometre-long fire front with a makeshift fire hose. He ran from a generator fixed to the, fixed to the back tray of his ute. When he saved his house, he put his life in great danger to save the homes of his neighbours. Terrifyingly and unmistakably alone, he drove up and down his abandoned street, wetting down homes as the fire lashed and spat around him, eventually surrounding him with zero exit points. Plan A, wet the houses down until the fire sweeps out of Mogo. Plan B, open the iron grate in the gutter on the street and slide into the stormwater drain. And, pl- and pray a bloke don't suffocate. Thank fuck I never had to go to plan B, he said. His head told him he was dead. His busy head was certain of it, but his heart told him something else. His heart said there was hope. And that was the theme of that endless summer, all that hope in the dark, our shimmering east coast turning to ash, homes buried in black dust, livelihoods stolen by flame. All that was left was stand, standing with brick chimneys and toasted metal frames of backyard trampolines. I saw these. The smell of animal death was everywhere. But still all that hope in the dark. Still all them swordless heroes. What happens when life gets so rough that the very act of waking up, hopping out of bed, walking out your front door, feels like an act of heroism? I remember the stunned faces of these two Bega Valley locals, Rodney Yalg and Tracy Campbell, as they looked upon a field of scorched earth and rubble that once was their thriving neighbourhood. The fire had changed them. The morphing fire villain made, made them morph with it. Tracy had survivor's guilt. She saw on the news all those grieving families and she wondered why she was spared. She started phoning old friends. She thought maybe she was still in shock. I just started apologising to people for anything I'd done when I was younger, she said. And she was weeping when she said this. I got in contact with family I hadn't spoken to for a while and I apologised for my bad deeds. That's what the fire did to me. I'll remember Jamie Robinson from Cabago. He was 25 years old in 1996 when he received a bravery medal for saving an 18-month-old girl from a house fire in the Canberra suburb of Holt. He was 33 in the summer of 2003, when Canberra bushfires burned his home and all his possessions to the ground. He was 50 when his Beager Valley home was turned to ash by the Black Summer Firefront. He found himself alone days later on his devastated property. But for his loyal half Kelpie, half Australian shepherd dog, Omi, surrounded by the charred wood and tin that was once his home. He was thinking about good and bad luck, fiddling with an old rope he'd found on the ground. He was thinking about that 18-month-old girl he saved all those years ago and why that act of pure heroism heroism didn't grant him a grace period with the universe, a reprieve from that fickle monster named Mother Nature. When he was done with all that thinking, he looked down at something he was absentmindedly tying together with his shaking hands. It was a noose. It's like, fuck it, Jamie told me. There's no point. I just wanted to exit the planet. And then my beautiful girl here, and he pointed at his dog, my beautiful girl here, Omi, she comes up, looks at me, and with a pause, I'm going to get emotional again, and with a pause, she kind of slaps my hands that are doing the tying of this noose. And she just stares at me, and I swear she does this big intentional blink like, don't be a fuckhead, Dad. Who's going to look after me? Jamie put the rope down and made his way into nearby Cabago, where he walked into the town's bushfire relief centre. And he didn't tell anyone his story. He didn't ask for any favours. My name's Jamie, he said to one of the centre's coordinators. I'm here to help. I'll remember the strength of Renee Salway. This is what I'll remember from 2020. Just the way she got out of bed each day, the way she kept going. I remember driving past the property where dairy farmer Patrick Salway, age 29, and his father Robert, age 63, died trying to save the family home. Patrick's wife, Renee, was the very definition of grace the following day, light from the dark. She got out of bed and she turned her thoughts to the sky because I guess she thought the sky was listening. I love you now, she said. I love you still. I will see you again, Patrick, my best friend. I hope you are up there fixing things in the stars tonight. 
And this is the wonder that's keeping the stars apart. I'll remember this feeling inside me right now. I'll remember this stripped back feeling. So strip it all back. Strip back the smart cars and the dumb clothes and the smartphones and strip back the Twitters and the Instas and the TikToks of social media and strip back, strip back the old endless TikToks of wall clocks sending you to work and to the grocery store and to school pickup, to dance class and to soccer practice and to the comfort of your bed. Strip it all back. Hell, this year, this pandemic, it stripped it all back on our behalf. This long year, 2020, it stripped back the trees so we could finally see the forests of our lives. And here was the great answer. The great answer resting in a perfect grass circle in the center of that forest where the woods are lovely, dark, and deep, and where we all have promises to keep. Remember this. Do not forget this. All that matters are the ones we love. Family, friends, love. Good numbers, good words, good love, Good food, good music, good dancing, good books, good stories, the good years together, the good years to come, good memories. I remember. Thanks so much for listening. They're my thoughts on on this year. It's straight from my heart and soul, but um, I'm so honored to share that stuff with you guys. It's, um, It's just really beautiful to get it off my chest. And this is what the Wheeler Center is all about, right? Telling stories. And it's the... It's our greatest invention. You know, don't ever, don't ever forget that the greatest thing we humans have ever come up with is storytelling. And um, it's so great to share some stories with you. Oh, my God, Trent. <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> that was so amazing. Oh, thank you, Caro. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I love this idea about going back to the idea you're talking about getting around the campfire because, of course, campfires yeah. are where we tell stories. And you oh, talked yeah. about statistics versus stories and how your daughter, mm-hmm. you know, was overwhelmed by the numbers. And But when you could break it down and tell stories, and I'd just like you to talk about, obviously you've had this amazing success, successes now times two um, with your work. And, and you talked a little bit before we started um, mm-hmm. on camera about how that took you on a whirlwind of, you know, all sorts yeah. of crazy things and away from your family mm. and how this has all yeah. brought that back. So could you talk a little bit more about storytelling um, on the bigger scale as well, but also on a, yeah. on a more familiar scale? Oh, great, great question, Caro. Yeah, um, oh, I just distinctly remember this moment that crystallised everything about where I was at in my life. Like so you know, careful what you wish for, right? Like careful what you dream about. I mean, I've, I've always, I just wanted to write that first book. I just, I, like I had this story to tell about how, you know, my mum fell in love with this dangerously successful heroin dealer in the 80s in Brisbane and my brothers and I found a secret room beneath his house and inside that room was a rotary doll red telephone that I'd always wondered where the hell does that go to and I've just carried that around for about 38 years. I wrote that book at 38. Um, and I thought five people would read it, my mum, my three older brothers and my wife. Um, but a lot more people than that read it and it kind of flipped me. It took me on a tailspin and, uh, uh, but, but I got swept up in it, Caro. And, um, and, and I have this big thing about just keeping my bloody ego in check and all those horrible things that make us the worst kind of, that make us all the negative sides of humanity, you know, all that like pride and all those things, you know, that come from kind of getting swept up in oneself. And then one day my youngest daughter just beautifully crystallized this. And it was happened to be the night before my 40th um, birthday. And you could not find a better sort of crossroads moment because everything had come true, right? All this amazing stuff had happened. And, um, and, but I was failing at something, right? And my most important role and, uh, and my daughter, youngest daughter is having a bit of a rough day. And I'm like, what's going on, darling? You know, you're not, you don't seem yourself. And she's like, we had this really deep sort of heart to heart. She's like, um, I don't know, dad, I just, I just feel like we're not as close as we once were. And I was like, oh man, like that was crushing Cara. Like that was just like, you know, so what I'm saying is, is what's it all for? What's it all, what, you know, okay, write a book and it sells or whatever. It's like, but man, you're not, you're not, you're not nailing that, that job that you're actually literally on this planet to do. Like you're, you're meant to be here inspiring that girl. 
with your stories. You're not meant to be out telling stories to every joker and sort of talking about yourself and all that stuff. I mean, that helps me. It helps me be a better dad and helps me sort of get a lot of stuff out of here and that I need to get out. But, um, but man, that night just, it was like, nah, just check yourself, mate. And just remember what you're really here for. And, and I just do find it fascinating that, you know, for me and my little microcosmic sort of point of view on this crazy year, you know, one thing, if, if there are to be, and I, I talk about silver linings lightly because it's sort of tricky territory because it's been so hard for so, so many of you wonderful people down in Melbourne, especially. And, but my little side of it is, is that it, it did allow me just to just pair back and just, man, I can sit around with Syl for three hours playing Monopoly and we'll tell stories till the cows come home. And it's been really, really beautiful, you know, to sort of to the point where she's like, all right, dad, all right, enough. Why don't you go write a book or something? You know, it's like, yeah. So, which has been really nice, but, uh, and this is, this is the great lesson for me. None of it matters. None of my ambition. Um, none of my, uh, could there be a, a worst, uh, more ridiculous first world problem than how's Trent's follow-up book going to go? And, uh, you know, so stop, forget about that. And that year taught me that as well. And just go upstairs and, and talk to the three people who matter in this world. And that's your wife and your two girls who are just upstairs. And so I think we all, you know, obviously we all learn that, you know, I think we all really, it was a great reminder to us, you know, to just go, oh man, I'm actually so lucky. I'm, you know, look, okay, it's pretty crap. I can't go outside or whatever, but all I do need is actually these human beings, you know? So yeah, that was, that was a really stark lesson for me. I just wanted to ask you, you know, what, what do you think is the greatest thing? What's the best thing about being a writer? Oh, wow. That's, oh, oh, well, well, look, I'm, I'm going to, well, I, okay. Oh, okay. Don't, okay. Look, I'll try and, I'll try and tell this. I'll try and tell it quick and I'll get to the point. Um, I once, I'm not, this is a massive name drop, Caro. This is ridiculous, but I only tell, I only say this story in reference to that question. Whenever anyone asks me that question about why, what are you doing this thing for? I once spent three days, um, traveling around with the, his holiness, the Dalai Lama. And like, it was a journal gig and I got, I got assigned by my editors. Like, you've just got to follow the Dalai Lama around Brisbane for three days. It was like, great gig. And at the end of it, I, um, I got to spend an hour with the guy talking with this great man, right? And uh, and my last question, I had all these deep questions. My last one was really big and it was, why are we here? And um, and and I meant, why are you here, Caro? Why am I? Why are all of us humans here? Like, what's the bigger picture? What's the meaning of life? Like, what the hell are we doing here on this third rock from the sun? And, and, uh, and but he, he makes it, this is the genius of the guy. He, he goes, come in. He, he goes, he gets me to lean in. He's like, come, come close, closer, closer. And I'm like leaning, we're like nearly, you know, brushing forwards. And he goes, you are here to tell my story. And he points at this, um, this, this sort of, um, there's this amazing guy who's, it's like his um, security detail. He was dressed in this black Armani suit. He looked like magic, uh, monkey magic dressed in a black Armani suit. Like he was the coolest guy on earth and he could kill you with two fingers. And he go, and he points at him and he goes, you are here to tell his story. And there was a woman from Channel 7 putting up some lights in the corner and he, and he goes, you are here to tell her story. You are here to tell your story. And then we share the stories and then we move forward and we learn about why we're here. And that's all. And you know what he said, Carrie? He said, that's all you have to do. Like he was just saying, Trent Dalton from Brackenridge, Brisbane, Queensland, Australia, that's all you have to do. And that was deeply, profoundly um, moving to me. And what he's saying is story is a incredible responsibility and uh, it is a role in itself. And that can be meaning. That can be your meaning. Let that be your meaning. And don't even get me started on what it's done for me as far as why do I write? Well, I write because I was given one thing that I could be good at. I cannot put a tent up. I cannot um, bake a sourdough bread very well. Um, I can do very little caro, but I can just hopefully string a couple of sentences together. And if I didn't have that ability, I swear to God, I'd be drinking straight bourbon and eating red rooster chips every night. And, um, and it's, it's that thing of writing that, that made me meet the girl that made me become a father to the kids and, and, and gave me, gave me everything. I mean, so that's why I write. It's like absolutely 
everything. It is the meaning of life to me, you know, and, uh, and the Dalai Lama, Dalai Lama told me so. So I've had it verified and it's, um, it's really nice to know. Yeah. So we'll keep on going. Just telling stories. Yeah. <laughs> well, Trent, listen, I've, I've taken a lot of your time. Thank you so much. And, and truly oh, we you. would love to, when you, when we can all travel again, please come and visit us, come and come and be our guest in person and, and uh, we'll do this yeah. in the flesh. Oh, Caro, um, just thank you. I can't wait. And you're on. And, um, and, but thank you for everything that you and the Wheeler Centre do for Australian storytelling. It's huge to us, you know, all of us writers. So, yeah, I can't wait to see you in person. And all of amazing Melbourne. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Now, our next treat for tonight, we will hear from poet Jazz Money, who will share her beautiful poem, Through the Moon. Jazz is a poet, digital producer, and filmmaker of Wiradjuri heritage, currently based on the Darug and Gundungurra nations. Jazz is the 2020 winner of the David Uniapon Award, and in 2019, Jazz was the inaugural winner of the Auntie Kerry Reed Gilbert Poetry Prize and a recipient of the Copyright Agency First Nations Fellowship. Her first collection of poetry is forthcoming with the University of Queensland Press. Yeah, Jazzy on Nadi, Rajri Yana Baladu, Dara Gundangar and Yuramangwarana. Hello, my name's Jazz and I'm at home on the beautiful lands of the Dara Gundangara. I want to pay my respects to their elders past and present for their continued custodianship over these beautiful lands, skies and waters. I'm very grateful to be a guest here away from my own Wiradjuri homelands. I'm going to be doing a reading tonight of a poem that I wrote in the midst of the pandemic. Uh, I was thinking about my mum, who lives in Victoria, who I couldn't go visit, and also thinking about how much we were learning all at once about so many different people from across the planet and how connected and disconnected we were in those moments and continue to be. It's called Through the Moon. Through the Moon. I went out to watch the moon rise and was met by a horizon full of clouds. There's comfort in knowing she's there, through this, through those clouds, something like calling mum on the phone. I've always been impressed by people who know about meteors, asteroids, celestial movements. I've always been amazed by people who can close off their hearts which is to say I find them awful. The moon is full tonight, but a sea of people will fall asleep hungry, watched over by tides, stars, clouds, that cannot feed, that cannot mourn. There is so much cruelty that a pandemic swallows, crowds out. The suffering of those in the light forces many more further into the dark. I've always been impressed by people who know about the migration of animals, of humans, of birds, who can read the tide or understand the trajectories of a heart. Why millions will walk away from their homelands or back towards them. I've always been amazed by my privilege, which is to say my ignorance disgusts me. I'm calling to my mother, to the moon. I'm calling home through the clouds of a virus that keeps me fixed in place as I try to understand stars, birds, human hearts. I'm calling home through the celestial objects I know and those that I'm learning. I'm trying to say I see you, which is to say I see you through a computer screen, which is to say I'm blinded by how little I know. Thank you, Mandanguru. And best of luck and lots of love for 2021. Thank you so much, Jazz. And now it's my great honor to welcome Bruce Pascoe. Bruce is a Yuan, Bunurong, and Tasmanian man born in the Melbourne suburb of Richmond. He's worked as a teacher, farmer, fisherman, barman, fencing contractor, lecturer, Aboriginal language researcher, archaeological site worker, and editor. He's also written 30 books, including Dark Emu, which won Book of the Year and the Indigenous Writers' Prize at the New South Wales Premier's Literary Awards. 
His new book, written with Vicky Sugar Roglu, is Loving Country, A Guide to Sacred Australia. Nights of Fire. I was sitting on my best friend's veranda drinking her tea. She was in the CFA shed in town and because the road had been blocked for 24 hours, she couldn't leave. She wouldn't get home for days, but neither of us knew that then. I sipped from a familiar cup and looked about. I raised the cup to the veranda and the trees. Goodbye, I said, convinced there was nothing more I could do to save them. The fire was all around us. All night, four of us had laid out hoses that we had hooked up to every tap in the little town of 20 houses. Two of those houses had already been lost. One of the owners of a lost home worked incessantly through the night for the sake of others. He was young and I gasped to keep up with him. That night I slept on someone's floor, fully clothed in a disgusting uniform, which I was too scared to take off. It had an element of safety to it and every pocket had things which might be useful in saving my life or someone's house. It wasn't a bad day if it wasn't for the sound of fire and the smoke clinging to us like a whisper of violence. I raised the cup again. Goodbye, loved house. Earlier we had started the diesel generator at a house of someone who wasn't there, watched as the engineer amongst us tried to work out its tricks. We peeked around the door to watch the approach of the fire. The fire was coming quite slowly, but it was coming. We weren't to know it would continue to do that for five weeks. The generator thudded into life and we ran around stealing hoses and fittings, dragging furniture off verandas, raking leaves away from the stumps. We worked hard, hoping we could set our hose lines and start the system in time. As soon as we finished, we turned on the water and saw a fabulous spray attempt to dampen houses and bush perimeters. We watched with some confidence, but not a lot. The sprays would often blow away or seem to evaporate in the scorching heat, and everyone's tanks would be almost emptied in the process. That's when I crept away and had a cup of tea. I put the cup down and looked at it, wondering if I would ever see the cup or the little rickety Chinese table again. Goodbye. I walked down to the jetty, which was covered in burnt leaves. I threw a few buckets of water across the planks, a tiny gesture of hope I didn't have. Burning leaves continued to land on the jetty and drop hissing. The eel that lived beneath the jetty, usually so vigilant for the sound of a footfall, and the promise of a fish frame didn't show itself. The first time I could remember it not surveying my approach. Everything was hiding. In a town where the cacophony of birdsong often drowned out our speech, there was silence. For those who lost their houses, that silence seems to have become a part of their personality. But we didn't know that then. We were lost in the oblivion of action. I stepped into my boat, Nadji, offering prayer to her again and again. Every road in the district was blocked by fallen trees. I had cut my way into several other houses during the initial fires, and within hours other trees had fallen to block them again. Nadji was the only thing that allowed me to keep fighting. When the tourists were evacuated by a Navy ship, Nadji took me into Malakuta so I could help fuel the supply boats. I looked around the town, so psychologically devastated that it was hard to witness. The fire hit Malakuta and was gone leaving buildings obliterated and people scorched. The town was in shock. I got back into Nadji that day with some diesel to keep dozers and tractors going up the river. I looked back at the town as we crossed the lake and she was blasting. Navigation was difficult because smoke lay close to the water. But the most difficult part was that the lake I had known for 50 years looked like a foreign stretch of water trees had either fallen 
or become skeletons. They slunk out of sight of the town, feeling like a deserter. I thought I should be showered in white feathers, but as I turned the bend at Cape Horn to approach Gypsy Point, I could see that the gully behind my house was burning fiercely. Again, what could possibly be left to burn, I thought, but knew I had to get to the house as soon as possible. When I arrived, the fire was into my property, and as I was doing my best to save buildings, I passed favourite trees in the process of being burnt to the ground. One tanker of water might have saved them, but every tank was precious, and I was preserving them for my buildings. Once again, I felt like a traitor as I slunk past their death. For most of that night, I fought fires on two sides of the property. I was completely alone. Neighbours were off fighting fires elsewhere or had retreated as the trauma took its toll on their minds. It was probably around dawn and I was beyond fighting. The fires were stable and I sank onto my veranda with a cup of tea in my own cup and looked up and shuddered. The flames were now coming from the west and threatening to cross the river. I paused, cup in hand, and then raised it. And for the second time in two days, I said goodbye to another cup in another house. But my luck remained and returned in time to save the house and theirs. During these days, I knew that my friend Freddie was dead, but I told them they were wrong because I was fighting a fire to save his brother's house just that morning. But I was wrong because three mornings had passed. I've known Freddie since my daughter. We crawled under Ronnie's house to rake away leaves and embers from beneath, firing off our normal jokes across our shoulder. It was comforting and familiarity. I had evacuated my daughter to Eden the morning the fires began, but demanded she ring me every two hours to tell me she and her family were all right. Freddie and I were driving up to his property to see what was left of it, and Marnie ran. We exchanged the briefest of information and she signed off with a call. Look after yourself, Dad. Freddie took the front phone from my hand. He's with me, Marnie. I'll look after him. It was typical Fred. I went off to fight for another house and Fred went down to the creek to start a pump. I never saw him again. Marnie was reassured by his words and began collecting other refugees from Malakuta and escorting them to Canberra. If Rebecca said everything would be all right, you knew it would be all right. Except this time, Freddie's heart gave out. The only time that had let him or anyone else down. I never saw my mates at Genoa until well after they had saved the town. I never saw the heroes of Wongrabel as, as they saved all they could of that beautiful valley town. Nadji took me upstream to check on the people up there. I found them still glowing with indignation that the CFA hadn't come to help them. My uniform received scornful stares. There were so many good people doing such brave things. And I now sit on my veranda with my intact house behind me and a cup of tea in front of me, trying not to feel guilty. I know everyone says you shouldn't allow that feeling, but I beg you to believe us. Our escape still feels like betrayal. Our standing house and teacups, things of shame. Bruce, thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing that incredibly powerful, incredibly moving story. Um, it still feels very resonant. Bruce, I'm interested in that, in the, in the idea about time. You talked about um, the time that you had seen your friend Freddie. You thought it was just the next, the, that day or the next, the previous morning, and it really had been three days. And I think we've all been in a strange time warp uh, this last year, this past year. Um, I wonder if you can just talk a little bit about that, about how we've warped and how time is just warped in these, in these under that kind of pressure, but also in this pressure cooker of a year? Well, I, I completely lost track of time 
Um, and even when people remind me that they think I was somewhere at a, on a particular day, I, I can't remember it. Um, I know I slept in my house sometimes. I know I slept in Lynn's house sometimes. I slept in houses of people who weren't even there. Um, I know that I ate. I can remember two or three meals, but the rest of it has gone. And I, you know, people talk about a particular time and a, a particular house. And I think, where did I sleep that night? I've got no idea. Um, I know I slept on the jetty one night next to the boat. I can't remember what night that was. I think, you know, and other people talk about this um, under under stress. You're so, um, your, your brain is so assaulted by the need to do stuff. But I, I don't think it reserves space for remembering the day. But anyway, it's, it's a bit of a mystery for me, and it's a bit, little bit confusing because other people seem certain of this and certain of that, and and um, I'm not. And yet, I talk to them about working with them, be you know, behind a house, and uh, they can't remember it. And yet, for me, it, it's vivid. You know, and our, our memories are scrambled, and um, it, it's very fresh. It's such an elusive thing, isn't it? What what burns brightly in somebody's in somebody's mind is is forgotten, and and vice versa. Um, we all have a different take on things. What lesson of hope have you, or what what sense of hope do you have coming out of this year? Um, this year, it's been a very tough year from the fires that you you so, you know, movingly describe, and the horror of those, and to into COVID. Um, and as we come out of this and say goodbye to this. Tough year, and what do you hope? What do you hope we take? What do you hope we take with us? And what do you hope that we've learned? Well, I I had the advantage of spending a lot of time with my grandchildren here. Um, um, they probably not as thrilled as I was because I'm um, I was trying to improve their table manners, <laughs> um, which took some. But I think it's a useful thing to have in a society. Um, and, you know, like everyone in Malakuta is um, a mate of mine and so when, they, when they're throwing or dropping food around the floor, one of my friends has to pick it up and that's an insult to me and an insult to them. So we did explain this and so they, I'm, I'm probably their very grumpy grandfather, but we did get to know each other. I, I picked up a piece of paper today that, my six-year-old granddaughter wrote, um, and she, COVID, we bought some ducks too um, because the kids love ducks and they love duck books, and so we bought some ducks um, and all gave them names. And so my six-year-old granddaughter wrote down everybody's name, the colour of the leg, leg tag of their duck and the duck's name. And um, I, um, when I found it, I thought, that's a treasure. That that's, um, goes straight to the pool room. You know, that, that is a piece of paper that will be uh, family heritage because the little girl um, is so courageous because she didn't know how to spell half the things, but she had a good go and was very, very close to being totally accurate. Um, but it's just a piece of paper to remind people of what we were doing during that period. And, you know, we got to swim and in the middle of winter, but that's what Malakuta is. Um, and um, we got to cook. Um, you know, we had so much to be thankful for. But, I'm, you know, I'm deeply in, involved in the environment movement. I'm deeply disturbed by the kind of forestry practice we have here. After the fires, there was this ridiculous campaign down all the big trees that hadn't been burnt from the fire. And so we lost canoe trees, ring trees, sacred trees um, that had weren't going to do anyone any harm, but it was like our public suddenly hated trees. Big trees were our problem. They're not our problem at all. It's the small trees that are our, our problem. And 
you know, there's a lot to f- to feel fear about in the environment, pollution of the waterways, um, all of those things. But I cannot afford to lose hope because those those my four grandchildren are all smart. Um, they're all clever little people, and they have such ambition for the earth. You know, they they went through my my plastic bucket and um, sorted all the plastics for me because I, I, I wasn't doing it correctly. So they disciplined me about my um, sorting strategy. Well, they needed to get you back. They needed to get you back over the uh, over the table manners. Clearly, it was yeah, revenge. It was, it was a kind of revenge. Um, but you know, if they're going to think like that, and if they're going to know so so many things about the environment that they can do that at their young age, then there's a lot of hope for their ability to turn things around. So, if my generation becomes pessimistic, we we stop our action. And it's like being in the bushfire. If you stop, you've lost it. You know, you have to keep going Um, because you you can't give up hope. And if I give up hope on my grandkids, and I refuse to because they're intelligent, uh, they're they're well-meaning, and uh, I'm convinced they'll make a difference. I'm convinced that the 25-year-olds and 30-year-olds on the farm are already making a difference. And, um, you know, they're very good at plastic identification and, um, you know, single source products and things like that. And uh, um, they are making a difference. You know, my daughter-in-law has stopped plastics in the town of Malakuta, plastic bags in the town of, sorry, um, Apollo Bay. And, um, you know, that's, that's a huge thing to do when you think that 10 years ago we never gave a stuff about it. And suddenly, you know, the, these young consciousnesses are insisting that we behave better towards Mother Earth. Um, so, you know, my um, daughter-in-law's uh, generation are doing wonderful things and I'm sure that my grandchildren's generations um, will do sensational things. I, I think I think the, the better angels um, of our nature will be brought to bear. I think that um, even though the days of Abbott and Trump um, are grim reminders of what humans do worst, um, there's enough going on to indicate that um, there's another era going to happen where we will value we will value intelligence, which we seem to have dismissed. We will value science, which we seem to have disbelieved. And we will value care, which we're, we're being told is unaffordable. You know, the fact that people are dying of hunger, you know, we, we rationalise that by saying, oh, it's too expensive. Too expensive to feed Africa and Indonesia. So we'll just... Uh, you know, we'll put a 500 gram steak on your plate, sir, because you can pay for it. It's disgusting. And um, we should all eat less uh, and better and share more. You know, I, I love my culture because it's most of our story about sharing food. They're not about accumulating wealth. The word gold doesn't appear in any are the stories that I know, and it's all about sharing and looking after Mother Earth. It's not about us. It's looking about her, looking after her. I love my culture. Bruce, I think that is just a beautiful way for us to end. Um, thank you so much. Um, I could talk to you forever. I wonder if there might be something that you would be interested to say about about that just very quickly, um, about the importance of, of, of hearing writers and, and having these kinds of conversations? Well, I, th- I think intelligence um, is to be supported. You know, intelligence is not to be repudiated or disdained. Um, ignorance is not to be applauded and celebrated. Um, and and Intelligence has no class. Wonderful to have you.
Okay, and I'll charge you a glass of champagne. To close out tonight's beautiful reflections of the year that was, we're so lucky to hear from Australian musical icon Paul Kelly. Paul wrote his first song in 1976 and has released more than 30 records. He has collaborated with many other songwriters and written music for film and theatre. His prose has appeared in Mianjin, The Monthly, Rolling Stone and The Age and in 2010 he published a mongrel memoir, How to Make Gravy. Tonight, Paul will share with us a few poems of hope and renewal drawn from his 2019 anthology, Love is Strong as Death, poems chosen by Paul Kelly. Hi, I'm Paul Kelly. 2020 is nearly done, and we're all looking forward to 2021. I'd like to perform a couple of pieces of hope and renewal. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And sweetest in the gale is heard and sore must be the storm that could abash the little bird that kept so many warm. I've heard it in the chillest land and on the strangest sea, yet never in extremity it asked a crumb of me. Trees are coming into leaf Like something almost being said The recent buds relax and spread Their greenness is a kind of grief Is it that they are born again and we grow old? No, they die too yeah, yearly trick of looking new Is written down in rings of grain Yet still the unresting castles thresh In full-grown thickness every May Last year is dead, they seem to say Begin afresh, afresh, afresh Begin afresh, afresh, afresh I leant upon a copper skate When frosts were specked the grey And winter's dregs made desolate The weakening eye of day The tangled vine stems scored the sky Like strings of broken lies And all mankind that haunted night had sought the house on fires The landshaft features seem to be The century's corpse at Lent His crypt the cloud it canopy The wind is death lament The ancient pulse of germ and birth was shrunk and hard and dry And debris spurred upon earth Seemed fervorless as I At once a voice arose among The bleak twigs overhead In a full-hearted even song 
joy illimited An aged thrush, frail, gaunt and small In blast bear ruffled plume Had chosen thus to fling his soul Upon the glowing So little cause for carolings Of such ecstatic sound Was written on terrestrial things Afar or nigh around That I could think there trembled through His happy good night Some blessed hope whereof he knew and I was on a way Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world. <laughs>